so today's uh, presentation is, um, or, or rather, say this uh, session uh, presentation is on uh, life as a data scientist. So I'm uh, Paul Mogridge. I am a uh, lecturer at the University of Hertfordshire, and uh, I research uh, data clustering. So today we're going to go through um, what is uh, data science, uh, why is it so useful. Um, we'll look at uh, how you can learn to become a data scientist. Um, and we'll look at some of the tools you can install on your machine to, um, uh, to, to get started. And uh, we'll also have a little bit of fun looking at a silly example uh, problem as well. Um, oh, so why data science? Why do we need data science? And um, the answer is very clear. Um, all, all of science uh, creates uh, data. We're always dealing with uh, facts and experiments that produce results and uh, industry uh, produces a lot of data as well as a byproduct of our uh, processes. So there's just so much uh, data constantly being uh, uh, created, but data isn't knowledge. And, um, and uh, data science is all about extracting that, no that knowledge from, uh, from the data. So um, of course, I'm sure you're aware we have our, our phones are getting increasing, increasing amounts of storage, our, our, our um, our computers are getting a larger hard drives, and we're, and we've got a storage on the cloud, and and this is and we're be able, we're able to save a lot more data, a, a lot longer history, um, and use uh, higher quality sensors. So in medical applications, um, uh, machines are are getting higher resolution. They're they're producing larger amounts of data. Um, we can have more and more sensors on devices. Think like autonomous cars have. So much we will be covered in all different uh, loads and loads of sensors, and our phones actually have loads of inputs on them as well. And um, so we're collecting a lot of data, and we're able to store a lot of data. And data science enables us to process this data. Um, with a um, with data science, we often look at things like uh, patterns, um, and um, be able to group objects and be able to label objects. These are things that. Um, uh, humans are, t are actually quite good at, but um, the challenge uh, is is that the data sets are so large. So, if I if I uh, said to you, can you? Uh, I showed you a picture of a uh, red blood cell, for instance. You may already know what one of those looks like. And I said, uh, can you uh, spot the red blood cell in in the next uh, fifty images? Um, I'm sure you would uh, you'd be able to learn, be able to recognize what the red blood cell is, and then be able to pick it out in the next 50 images with uh, no trouble. But then if I said to you, could you pick it out in the next uh, 10,000 images, you may complain quite rightly. So uh, uh, computers are a really useful, uh, of course, this an essential tool in uh, data science, and they're able to process uh, massive, massive amounts of data. And, um, and also in uh, higher dimensions than, uh, than, than, than we can work. So if I were said, uh, can you recognize uh, a red blood cell in this five dimensional data set that has these other um, um, measures, so you can't actually visualize it. Um, you uh, that would then, of course, be much, much harder, um, effectively impossible, um, just using your uh, eyes. And uh, so, um, so that's why um, it's, a, it's, a, it's so useful, and it's a lot, of course, a lot of fun as well. What um, um, a reason to do it itself is it, it's because it's a Fantastic discovering knowledge, uh, sometimes for the first time. Um, and it's great solving all those problems. A, a, a um, individual in a company or, um, or a research group might uh, find a, um, will, will, will come to you with a problem. Your job is to understand the problem and then to, uh, to give them the knowledge they need to solve that problem and make a good decision. Um, so, and sometimes the uh, knowledge you might extract might actually be surprising. So there's, um, uh, Quite a few examples from um, from supermarkets uh, about similar items that they put together. So they put this item next to this other item, or these two aisles next to each other, uh, because of knowledge they've extracted uh, uh, through um, data science. Um, one that, that comes to mind is um, this is them in America, to say in so at Walmart, I believe. Um, they uh, found that our pop tarts uh, sell sevenfold uh, on the run up to a hurricane. And um, and you think why why um uh, why pop tarts? But then of course they got a long shelf life and they're quite a comfort food. So so if if you were thinking that there might be a chance of a hurricane, that's another thing that would sell. So that's an unusual 
uh, correlation. You know, for example, something surprising you might find. Um, so we understand now uh, why data science is important and why we want, we want to uh, uh, use it and uh, study it. But what is it? It's really, um, it's really kind of uh, the intersect of kind of uh, three different areas uh, shown by this uh, Venn diagram. It's, it's quite a famous uh, Venn diagram in, uh, in data science. And, um, and it shows that there's three different areas. Uh, one is uh, essentially programming skills. So this is the ability to be able to program in Python um, or R or, or, use, or use a computer well, essentially, in a, maybe in a number of languages. Um, and then the, another element is um, math and statistics, to be able to understand how the algorithms work, when to apply them. And then and, and the final element is actually having some domain knowledge um, to understand a, a, a particular problem. And when you bring all those three things together, uh, that's when you get uh, data science. And it's and, and really is a um, really very useful and very important um, area like uh, being able to, um, you, of course, uh, just having just uh, two of them, maybe just having a uh, maths and so sort of, and um, and domain knowledge, that's uh, the traditional research that's just using uh, typical simple methods to look at the data. And uh, and maybe just having hacking skills and uh, and uh, domain knowledge can be a bit of a dangerous area. You may apply an algorithm without knowing what they uh, what they can what they're doing or understanding the actual output. And uh, using uh, programming knowledge and uh, math statistics at the same time is is just uh, researching into data science uh, and improving the algorithms. But when you bring them all three together, that's when you find uh, discover knowledge, and that's what data science is all about. So as a day to day. Um, job of being a data scientist, you'll be following a, a, a kind of cyclic process um, where it starts with uh, finding a, a problem, a bit more light on the subject, um, where um, you'll be, uh, you'll, you'll talk to a, a business professional, be given a problem and uh, access to their database or a source of data or set, a set of sensors. And from there, the first step you'll be taking will be selecting data. And um, so some of the data might not be relevant, for instance. So say you was uh, researching, um, say you was uh, uh, recommending videos for, um, for different groups of people, maybe their phone numbers uh, isn't, uh, isn't an important piece of information that's available. So that information, you wouldn't select that as a column. Um, uh, Pre-processing of uh, data, you then, um, Make all these uh, all of these columns uh, remove fix any missing uh, missing uh, data items. You would um, handle any outliers. There's a uh, lot of uh, data cleaning steps that you could take that do take up uh, quite a bit of uh, do make up quite a bit of time of the job um, resolving these issues. Then there's a uh, transforming the data. So maybe you've got a very high dimensional data set with lots of dimensions, and so you've got loads and loads of columns. And that could be a real big problem for certain um, uh, data mining um, algorithms. So you might reduce the dimensionally, dimensionality down, or you might plot it in a different coordinate space. And uh, then for the exciting bit, actually running a data mining algorithm. So, so this could be classification, clustering, uh, creating decision trees, um, some kind of pattern recognition. This is the exciting part. And um, so there is quite a bit of, um, uh, struggling for the right word, but uh, essential tasks that um, on the run up to it, and maybe maybe this is possibly ninety percent, and uh, this is maybe ten percent. But but this is really really exciting. This is when you just um, when you select algorithms, you extract that knowledge, and you present that knowledge in the next step um, back to those people that had the problem, and you ask and you ask them, does this um, does this uh, make sense to to, the, to these correlations to these findings? um you know fit with uh, your understanding of the domain and if it's yes then fantastic you've created some knowledge and they can maybe use that uh, knowledge to solve a problem um although if, if not maybe it's possibly false and you need to repeat part of the process there's lots of different methodologies as well as uh, the kd that's a, a knowledge discovery and databases process um and uh, there's a sort of semi process largely the same same steps, selecting your data, uh, cleaning, the, cleaning the data, transforming it, etc. actually applying the module, model, and then um, 
calculating, calculating the metrics on the uh, data set and checking it with the domain expert and then possibly going back to the beginning again. And then uh, much the same again, another one, uh, CRISP DM, another, another um, process uh, for the data scientists would go a team or, or indeed a team of data scientists would go through on a daily basis. I'm not sure I'm, I'm just uh, to see if I've got any questions. Um, okay, so I've got a few questions. Um, so which uh, A-levels did I take? Um, actually, myself, I didn't um, uh, take uh, A-levels. I actually took a BTEC and I did a, um, a BTEC in uh, IT, a level three or three BTEC for IT practitioners, in fact, and um, and uh, at that I um, I, was at, I went to college and I, and I learned also a lot of practical IT skills and um, and also taught myself to program um, there as well. Uh, it, it was in a language called um, Blitz Basic, which is kind of like a three D um, games making language, and that was a great fun. But, but that's really the program learning to program is really the bread and butter of uh, data science, computer science. Um, so um, taking a course that uh, maybe uh, helps you or learning independently from a book or from online videos, how to program is really important. Um, but I think, yeah, I think uh, these days, I think, um, I wonder if there's actually more specific courses than just going into an IT or computer science, A-level or B-tech. Uh, once you get to university, there's uh, definitely options to go down an artificial intelligence route, which is uh, uh, what I did. Um, that's what I was um, yeah, makes sense. Yeah, so um, yeah, uh, any questions, yeah, feel, uh, feel free to uh, fire away. I'll, I will answer some more questions at the end, or if I see any more throughout, I'll, I'll keep checking. Um, so uh, yeah, so we might be in a team of uh, data scientists, or we might just be working individually. Um, uh, there's lots of different techniques that you can use. So you would be um, regression or, or classification. This is where you're trying to find the relationship between um, very a, a group of bunch of variables that you can easily measure and a, and a variable you want to know uh, you want a label effectively a class you want to be able to recognize or a trend um, so this uh, that's the most uh, commonly used uh, uh, data science uh, technique so uh, the way we have a label data set and uh, you and you want to be able to uh, figure out what um so I, I could, I'll show you this is a chair this is this is an apple and you want to be able to and you want to be able to reckon I'll show you a data set with those labels, and then you'd want to be able to recognize, um, I'd then show you an apple without the label, and you'd have to say that it's an apple, or you'd be able to recognize the trend, the relationship, build a, build a model that represents that uh, that trend in the data. So, you, so I could say, okay, this is going like this, what's the next, um, what, uh, what, uh, what would this, what would these variables be? Um, another popular technique is decision trees. This is where we build a tree, a rather more looks more like the roots of a tree typically, and uh, you and you break it off um, on each uh, column. Um, you would say, okay, this uh, this threshold or this uh, nominal value uh, goes down this path, and you get down to the bottom of the tree, and it tells you which class it is. So it automatically generates a tree, like like a, if it's this, then this, then this tree, to tell you what the class is. So you can follow that follow that model through by hand, look at it for insights, or even run it on a computer. And then a clustering, which is what I research. Um, it might be a little bit small, I should probably zoom in. Um, clustering is where we don't have the labels on the, on the data set. So we show it loads of pictures of chairs, loads of pictures of apples, for instance, and it recognizes, what it does is it recognizes that those are two different things. So those are the top uh, different techniques, of course, visualization, uh, plotting the data, um, very important. So next we'll just, uh, there's lots of, uh, Applications of uh, data science, uh, of course, uh, one that you probably use just to get uh, get here is a Google, Google search engine. And uh, the director of uh, research at, uh, at Google is called uh, Peter Norvig. And he actually created a, uh, a fantastic book. I actually, actually got it up here. Um, it's quite a mighty tome, quite a thick book. Um, Artificial Intelligence, a Modern, modern Approach by uh, Stuart J. Russell and Peter Norvig. And this is a, a fantastic book on artificial intelligence, which is what really what underpins a lot of uh, data science. And, and you, probably, you may come across it at some point. And um, uh, Alina Crivello, she works at a, um, a crude oil uh, processing, uh, a company which handles crude oil. And, uh, they're, and they're, in that case, they're looking at uh, sensors um, to improve the oil processing. 
um, or a process and efficiency. And uh, then we've got uh, one that you may have used uh, uh, possibly last night or maybe it'd be, uh, one of the evenings this week, or maybe over uh, Netflix. And um, the data scientist behind Netflix, uh, the head data, uh, vice president of data science analytics and Netflix is called Catalina Smallwood because it's a massive team of people. Um, her team uh, develops uh, uh, out there algorithms which uh, recommend videos essentially. So, so it's when you watch one type, so maybe you're into uh, rom-coms or maybe you're into action movies and then that everyone will recognize the type kind of person you are and then show you more of those kinds of categories of videos and tries to um, uh, essentially guess what you'd be interested in, keep you interested in the service and using it. Lex Friedman, um, a researcher at MIT, um, looking into autonomous cars and that might revolutionize a transport. Um, that's a, obviously a very uh, complex area Look at all lots of uh, uh, taking all, the, all those sense all those cameras and radar readings and trying to recognize the different objects and their intentions and trying to predict forwards what um, what's going to happen next. So you've got almost you've got a video stream of coming from from all the cars cameras and you're and you're trying to predict what uh, what well, several frames into the future would look like. So so what 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 is the video stream going to look like in fifty frames from now? And if that reality comes true, what do, what actions does the car need to take? That's uh, that sort of thing. And he, he actually previously worked at Google looking at a Hagrid based authentication. So that's authentication that doesn't use uh, passwords, like uh, traditional. Uh, traditional. So, so there's a, as I mentioned before, there's kind of three areas that you need to, to learn. Um, one of those is maths. So, um, so whilst you're at a secondary school, I imagine many of you are in a secondary school as you're watching this. And, um, or even maybe not physically in secondary school, uh, due to the uh, pan current pandemic. But but you'll be uh, learning. Uh, you'll be able to learn these sorts of things. And um, algebra, geometry, calculus. These will help you understand how the um, algorithms work, and the machine learning algorithms that you'll be applying in that data mining step, and in the transformation step, as well, and even in the pre-processing step as well. All those three steps. Understanding uh, what their weaknesses are, understanding in, on at least on a basic level how they work, so that you can apply them uh, correctly. Um, and the other one uh, you'll need is uh, some uh, Boolean logics. This is understanding truth tables to help you with programming, and and uh, set theory as well is also useful for handling uh, lists of data and the data sets and slicing, slicing data sets, etc. So another area you need to be strong in is a uh, uh, computing computing and IT. So you, you can get learn this again at secondary school as well, and or indeed college or in your A levels, or um, even just at, uh, even just at home. There's plenty of uh, um, online resources to learn these types of skills. Um, uh, being good with spreadsheets is a good is a good start. Um, understanding how databases work, uh, particularly uh, SQL databases. A lot of businesses have backed up by a large SQL database uh, somewhere and, the, and at some point they'll hand you hand you over to this uh, to a, a SQL prompt to a SQL query SQL manager tool and you have to extract the data out of that so being, being familiar with SQL is quite important or other languages as well MongoDB is another popular database. Um, a program as I've already touched on very very important to be able to to use a lot of the um, tools that we'll mention in the next section um, you need to be able to uh, program, ideally, a popular language, a very up and coming popular language. But one of the most pop best languages to learn right now, I think Stack Overflow recommended it. Uh, Stack Overflow is a very popular um, uh, website forum where you can ask questions about uh, when you have a code problem, and they'll and they'll uh, answer the question for you. And and, and uh, that and that site uh, recommends that Python is actually the best language there. There's most amount of help, and it's also the language again the most amount of questions asked has been used in so many different ways you can use it in all sorts of ways a fantastic language to to learn um uh, also being good with a obviously part of the job as well when you come to the final stage is actually presenting that knowledge you found back to the back to the the domain experts um and uh, this uh you will obviously need to create presentations and graphics and good visualizations and uh, also, you may be interested in academic publishing too, as you apply uh, data science and as you uh, possibly even create new um, algorithms, machine learning algorithms or pre-processing techniques. 
uh, you may want to publish those back to the community and give back to the scientific community. And uh, the, the typical tool to do this is a tool called LaTeX, um, spell um, L-A-T-E-X, and uh, that's like a, a, a publishing tool, like a, a bit like if you've, if you've done some HTML, it's similar to that. Um, you can also use Word as well. Uh, being good with Word, you can uh, publish, uh, publish articles back to the scientific community. So those are the uh, kind of IT skills you'll need. Personal skills are very important too. Um, you need to be able, uh, as to be able to communicate well, with, uh, particularly with a team of other uh, um, other data scientists on very complicated issues. Sometimes it's just almost just not the words you. The problems you'll be having will be uh, quite hard to explain, and um, and you need uh, good communication skills. You might need some project management skills as well. Um, there's lots of steps as you've seen that you have to go through and, and manage. And uh, you must, uh, it's such a, um, data science is such a young field and uh, it's been around for tens of years. So there's still room for Edison's and Einstein's in this field. And um, so you can still make a big discovery and uh, you need to constant, constantly stay uh, researching and, and be aware of the, of the best solutions to different problems. So you need to be a, someone who's a strong at learning uh, and researching um, issues constantly throughout your career and uh, also disseminating your findings as well. So sharing your uh, results, be good at basically being good at presenting. Um, and in maybe creating dashboards as well. Another way for sharing your results is through a dashboard. Um, so there's lots of ways to learn, you know, lots of online videos, online courses and communities. There's some fantastic books. I'll, ref I'll um, mention these at the end. And of course, there's a traditional education um, a school because you can pick up a certain amount. A college you might be able to get something uh, closer, and then a university you might be able to get um, a, something even closer, even more specific. Maybe artificial intelligence qualification in that, and uh, some of the modules in that uh, maybe data science or data visualization, and that will help you aid you in getting a job. Um, then, um, so to get started with the tool, so I think we've talked about uh, what data science is now. And uh, there's lots of different uh, tools you can use to actually get started with, uh, with data science and actually practice it this afternoon or this evening, indeed. Um, just to name a few, there's a, there's a machine learning library called uh, Weka um, from New Zealand. And, that's, um, and that is a, a, a Java API, a Java library, um, and a GUI application that you can use to run machine learning algorithms. Um, Another popular one is uh, SPSS by IBM. So this is a kind of statistics package um, with uh, lots of um, machine learning errors embedded into it as well. And so it's quite complicated and uh, costly. Um, and there's um, RStudio, which is uh, quite popular. There's a free tier on RStudio. And, um, and uh, that's a, a very powerful and easy way to get started straight away. Although I think R can be a bit of a tricky language at some times. So, so the one that I would recommend, which I think is also, I would argue possibly the most popular as well, is um, is a is in Python with uh, Jupyter notebooks. And the best way to install this is via Anaconda. So um, it's uh, completely free. If you go to this web link, and uh, you'll find a, uh, you can then go get started. And um, and what Anaconda is is a it's a single installer which installs all the uh, Python and loads of uh, machine learning libraries and several uh, IDEs, so essentially fancy text editors to work on your Python code and to build your projects with. So just to run through a few of these, what the different, these different icons mean, Jupyter, Jupyter Notebooks, this is um, a tool I'll show you later, but we're gonna use to uh, work on our data. Uh, SciPy, this is a kind of statistics, um, kind of statistics package, NumPy for working with matrices, um, Scikit Learn has a lot of the machine learning algorithms. Pandas, this is for handling uh, um, data frames and uh, loading data sets, etc. Matplotlib, which is exactly how you're going to plot, um, create nice uh, plots. And uh, TensorFlow, um, I use uh, TensorFlow via Keras, but we won't, we won't cover that today for, uh, for deep learning. So you can apply some, um, so you can use some of the cutting edge uh, state, they are very powerful. Um, uh, neural network type algorithms. Um, 
So to, so when you click uh, uh, get started, you'll come to a, an installer screen, select the one uh, for your relevant operating system and install it. Uh, once you've installed it, uh, you'll come to, if you're a traditional platform you install it on, if you install it on Windows, I believe it gives you a Jupyter Notebooks um, icon on your desktop that you can click, which will look like um, this, this icon here, those two orange uh, C's with those little gray and moons around it, I suppose. And um, and, uh, what, and you can double click on that icon and it'll open your browser, uh, strangely, and uh, and open a tab with, and you'll see something like this. You'll uh, see Jupyter running in your in your browser. Essentially, it's running a, a server on your, uh, just a little local server on your computer and you can just interact with it through your, through your browser. So you can create a folder, create an empty folder, and then you can click on a uh, new and then a new Python 3 uh, Jupyter Notebook. And when you create a new uh, Python 3 Jupyter Notebook, um, you can then um, um, you can then get started with actually typing your Python code. So in these uh, little boxes here, you can uh, type some Python code and you can then hit control and enter and then run that Python code and you'll see the results directly below it. It's a um, fantastically uh, easy way to work with Python. You can, of course, can use Python on the command line. You can obviously write Python in a normal IDE and then run the program and get the output that way. The nice thing about Jupyter Notebooks, um, one is that um, whatever the last statement you put in one of these boxes is, it'll automatically print. Um, so here I'm, I'm not using that uh, feature, but if I had another variable named down the bottom of here, whatever it is, whether it be an image, a, um, a table, or just some text, it will then print that final thing out. So it's very uh, handy and quick to, to develop um, with, <coughs> or to use uh, all the different libraries with. And you can also embed a Markdown. So some of you may be familiar with Markdown. Uh, Markdown, again, is a bit of a thing, thing a bit like HTML where you can um, essentially uh, create little documents in text. Then you hit Control Enter and it compiles it into what it looks like. So it's nice because you can have code and explanations um, alongside one another. So the problem, I'll quickly just check if we've got any questions. We'll take a quick question, question break. Um, how much can an under, undergraduate earn? Um, I suppose I'm not. I'm not too sure on that. I, I think I. I can't give you. A, I won't give you any exact answer on that. Although I think typically dead science is quite um, a well paid. Um, what does a um, typical day involve? Um, uh, meetings, uh, meetings with um, business professionals um, who are who are from their objectives they they want to achieve. And um, and then uh, a lot of it is um, working with their uh, databases as, and and pre-processing that pre-processing that data and trying to create a, a good uh, data set that, that represents that, that's fair and has a good representation of all different um, of all different groups and cases. And um, so a lot of it is um, is uh, typically uh, programming and. Um, Meetings and, and programming and and, and uh, research and learning, so that's the um, some uh, some teams will uh, have a stand up meeting at the start of the day where they'll all the first thing they'll do is they'll work for a little bit and then they'll have a stand up meeting. They'll talk about what they're going to do uh, in that day, and then they'll um, they'll do each of those tasks. They'll all work together using a thing called a Git repository, um, or any repository indeed. There's other other repositories are available. And uh, this is uh, like a a place where everyone can commit their code and uh, and um, and uh, work work on the same uh, code at the same time, and it will merge the code the best it can. Um, it's really easy, but if we work on different sections and different um, files, and, and it creates not doesn't really create a much of an issue at all. It just does it behind the scenes. And um, yeah, so you'd uh, work on those bits of code. You'd run the model. You then uh, you look at your metrics. Um, and maybe your adjusted random uh, index or silhouette coefficient. You look, you look at these different scores and you'd see, am I getting towards a good score? And what is, and um, if you want, you then you then create some visualizations and uh, the, and produce a presentation and come back to the to the um, to the uh, people with the problem, the in the company, 
and uh, and uh, try and um, and show them what you've learned and ask them if it's meaningful. And that and that, that could be a typical day. So a mixture of um, meetings, coding, and and coding and talk and uh, working as a team. Um, and yeah, so from an point of view, that's a tricky question to answer. I think um, th I think it's typically it, 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 there's all uh, different uh, different levels. Um, I'd, I'd say it's fairly normally fairly well paid, fairly well paid role, similar to being a uh, software developer. Um, as a um, intern, you might you, uh, you might be in the in the uh, low, or as a sorry as a um, as starting out with that, as an undergrad, you might be in the low twenties, and then and then, and as you progress through your, uh, through your career as a programmer or data scientist, you might be in in the uh, high thirties, low forties uh, area. But it really depends on the company, and um, and that's a very much ballpark um, ballpark numbers. Obviously, I imagine some of those uh, famous data scientists I mentioned previously are. Are on uh, on substantial uh, probably have quite good uh, incomes. Um, any more questions for now? Oh, okay, yeah, about thirty four. Yeah, about a uh, place where on the average salary paid less than eight years experience is about thirty four. Yeah, that's, that sounds about right. Yes, yeah, so that's, that's actually quite high. That's um. So um. So uh, now on to our example problem. Um. Uh, um, the area that actually I research is uh, data clustering, and um, and we'll, data clustering is uh, unsupervised learning, as I mentioned. Unsupervised means we don't have the labels um, on any of the data, so we've got nothing to uh, to, to train us with. Um, we haven't got loads. We have a label data set that we can train it on. So loads of examples of apples and loads of examples of chairs. We've just got loads of images that we don't know whether the chairs are apples, effectively. So so we're using uh, unsupervised learning. And it worked, clustering is a type of unsupervised learning. And um, there's two ways you can use clustering. Um, one is as a pre-processing step um, because you want to do a classification, but you don't want to apply it. You don't want to label all of your, all of those images, all of those uh, rows of data, or you actually can do it in as a step itself, as, a, as an exploratory step, which is um, uh, how we use it today to see what groups you've got in your data and to calculate the, the, um, the, the statistics for those different groups. Um, so the problem will be something say, it's kind of a fun problem, a bit of a silly problem, not maybe that, uh, not very, maybe not as uh, realistic as we could have done. Um, but, um, but hopefully uh, makes, uh, is an engaging example. Um, so there's been a burglar breaking and entering into the university, uh, smashing through the windows and stealing the precious clustering research. Oh no. Um, we need to figure out which one of the suspects it is, A, B, or C. And um, each of the suspects has been found with glass fragments in their shoes. So they've been smashing through those windows. This is also a made-up scenario. Um, and they've all got glass fragments in their shoes. So um, this is not the first time those are glass fragments. Um, the police has uh, seen glass fragments. And, the, and they've analyzed um, 200 glass fragments in their lab. And some of those glass fragments, they know where they came from. So they know, and so for some of them, they, they do have a label. For, for the vast majority, they don't have a label. And um, unfortunately, these uh, suspects A, B, and C, they don't um, have a, the, the, the pieces of glass don't match any of the pieces of glass um, they currently got labeled. Um, so now I'll quickly show you an example in uh, Jupyter Notebooks itself. Bit of fun. Um, so this is a uh, Jupyter Notebooks um, running on uh, in my Firefox browser on my on my Ubuntu machine, and um, so the first step here. We, so this is but this part is just an example of a, a markdown a markdown area. So I, so I can so I can do formatting. So I want to make that a heading two, heading three, and so on, and then hit Control Enter to, to recompile it or to rerun the markdown. <clears throat> and uh, so here's my first bit of uh, Python code. Um, here I'm importing the, those different libraries we saw installed when we installed Anaconda. So NumPy and Pandas. And then I'm importing a number of sklearn, um, uh, science kit learn uh, libraries to, um, to, do, to complete various pre-processing tasks, transform tasks, and to do our data mining clustering. And we're also importing our uh, matplotlib um, to do our plotting and uh, 
and uh, some 3D tools as well. So I've started off with, uh, this is actually a real data set that you can actually download. So um, so uh, there's a thing called uh, UCI uh, data sets, if you uh, Google that. Uh, UCI or UCL? Um, possibly UCL actually. Um, uh, no, UCI, UCI data sets. Uh, Google that and then on that web page, it does a little bit of an old fashioned looking web page. Um, you can then uh, Google, um, search inside that site for um, for the glass data set and you have to download the data set that I'm using. Um, it was, uh, of course, they're not created for this purpose, but this is how we're going to use it. We're going to pretend that we don't have the labels. The data set does actually have all the labels for different types of glass. Um, the data set has, um, I think that's nine, is it? Nine or so, ten, uh, ten columns. Well, if we ignore the ID, then nine, uh, nine columns, uh, which measure different things about the glass. So we've got the refractive index, um, then a number of different elements, and how much, I suppose, a measure of how much um, of those elements is in the glass. And uh, we've got a class. Um, we can, we, we're going to pretend we don't have this, uh, we, the label of the glass, the type of glass it is. So just to load that data set, so you download that data set from, from, the, um, from the website. And then uh, you can load that data set using pandas into a thing called a data frame. So just place that, um, that, that glass data set in the same directory that you've created your um, notebook file in. You can then, uh, um, in this case, I'm removing the labels. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm removing the ID column and I'm removing the uh, class column. So you can see that I'm dropping those two columns there. And uh, then I'm displaying the uh, top 10 rows of the data set. So we can see we've got the top 10 rows here and um, these are different columns and we can see the data here. And if we have, we can take a quick look and we can do a, uh, do a fit describe. And we can, so we can just, so we can just type Python into this, into this, uh, that one's now disappeared, into these boxes on Jupyter Notebooks and just hit Control Enter on your keyboard. Um, I think you can use either Control, although I use the Control underneath the main Enter, underneath the Shift key, just so it's uh, quicker to do. And, um, and you can then uh, run this little block of um, of uh, Python. So uh, actually make sure, I've actually run this before, so you'd have to run that first or import all your libraries so that this part would work. So if you, you can't run them, you still need to run through them in, in the order um, that you need them. So, so you can then uh, load the data. So we see here that the data is currently got lots of different scales. Some of it's um, on quite a minute scale from 0.0, .0 Five to 0.5 for the iron, and um, for the uh, magnesium, it's on a, on a much larger scale. Um, oh, that one's on uh, silicon, I think that's SI. It's on a, it's on a huge, uh, on a, on a huge scale. And then, oh no, it's not it's actually from fairly small scale, but, um, but anyway, they're, they're on all different um, levels of uh, severity, and uh, so one of the. One of the best, one of the very sensible things to do to your data is to normalize your data. So I've uh, now normalized it between um, zero and one. So all the data is between zero and one, rather than being whatever values it was before. Between uh, between uh, 69 and 75, it's now between zero and one, and all of them between zero and one. So we'll have the same uh, scale. <clears throat> so the next step is to reduce the, um, in this case, um, we've got quite a fairly high dimensional data set. Um, and also just for the convenience of visualizing it for this example, uh, we can reduce the uh, dimensionality down. So to do this, um, we can do a thing called a principal component analysis. So if you imagine, um, if you imagine a, a, a data set that's like a sausage shape, in some ways is you could almost represent it on one axis. So you've got this, this data that correlates quite strongly and uh, you could, uh, Without you'd lose some of the information, but you could squash those two axes together, and um, and have all the information on one axis, and have most retain most of that information in the data set. So that's essentially what this um, principal component analysis does. So we're taking that uh, nine-dimensional uh, data set, some crazy axes going on, and then we're um, squ squishing that down into a three-dimensional um, into a three-dimensional space. And in doing that, we lose some information. So we've just uh, one dimension, if we squashed it down to one dimension, hypothetically, we'd have to keep 45% of the information. 
if we squash it down to um, um, uh, two dimensions, um, there's, a, there's a little bit, this uh, axis here is a little bit misleading, I apologize. Um, we'd keep out 20% or just like less than 20%. And um, and in three dimensions, we, we um, oh, sorry, this is cumulative. So that's 45 plus, um, plus 20 percent plus another um, 15 percent. So we're keeping a good amount of the information in the, in the data set. So if we just have one, we just have 45 percent of the information left in the data set. So, so we've squashed it down into a, into a visualizable number of data sets. So we can now visualize it using a matplotlib. So we can now, whoops, I should have run this one, didn't I? Didn't run that. Didn't run this one. And I can now uh, visualize uh, that data in a three dimensional space. So, but now it looks like we have um, some outliers. We've got um, a point uh, floating out here on its own, some points that are quite, um, they're quite out of, uh, they're not uh, very representative of the clumps of density we've got, which is what really two clumps of density, you could maybe argue more. Um, so, we, so we've got some low density areas that uh, possibly contain outliers. So what's the one way, so maybe the next step now will be to remove outliers. We can do this uh, using an algorithm called the local outlier factor. This is a density-based outlier, outlier um, removal algorithm. There's lots of other ways of handling outliers, of course. But this is probably a fairly complex way of handling outliers. There's a simple way is just to, um, is to do a thing called a winds arising. We just clip off the corners, basically. So anything that's outside this range, you just pull it in. Um, and there's, um, of course, you can replace the value with a mean. That's not a terribly good thing to do, or, or a modal value. Um, you can just delete those rows as well. Uh, you can just delete these, uh, these points, these uh, rows of data that represent these, uh, these outliers. Um, but here we'll uh, use a local outlier factor algorithm. And this has reduced the instance count down from 214, what it was originally, down to uh, 171. And um, doo -doo 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 -doo, and uh, we can now plot that data, and we can see um, that all those uh, points, are, those uh, outline points, are gone. So now for the exciting bit, we can now actually uh, cluster the data. So we can use the simplest type of cluster, a k-means cluster. This um, randomly takes two uh, points to two places in the inner data set, drops two things called centroids. Um, it, we then see what points are closest to these two centroids. We then calculate the average position of all of those points and move those centroids to those positions. Then the cycle repeats again. We then look at what's the nearest points to those um, centroids. We then calculate the average of those points, remove them, and so on until they move no longer. And so the k-means is the simplest and very popular algorithm. It has several weaknesses. Um, so it's found um, you have to tell it how many clusters you're expecting in the data set. So we're expecting, in this case, we'll be that we know we're expecting two clusters. There's ways of finding a number of clusters. Um, we can now plot that with, with the uh, color representing our clusters. Um, so we've now got, um, we've, uh, actually this isn't as well as I was hoping actually, on, my, on this example. <coughs> um, okay, that's, that's a bit of a better extrusion because this algorithm is um, stochastic. Each time I run it, I get slightly different results. Stochastic means random. So, so there's an element of um, randomness in this algorithm. And you, um, and if you, uh, you might have picked up on it when I, when I mentioned it earlier, we, we randomly pick those two starting points. So where we pick those two starting points, the starting points of these two green centroids, we call them, um, impacts where, um, impacts, um, yeah, obviously where they end up moving and they might not move into the most optimal position on the first try. So, um, so we've now found that there's sort of two clusters in the data. And, um, and uh, now uh, from that, we can now um, recognize that there's, there's uh, two different uh, groups. And we, use, uh, we can now plot our ABC within our suspect species. We send them to a lab, analyze their pieces of glass, and plot them within this three dimensional space. So you see that C seems to be in this cluster, and A and B seem to be in this cluster. And, um, and, and thus, so if we can just um, identify which, um, what, uh, what cluster this, uh, what type of glass this cluster represents and what type of glass this cluster represents, uh, we, we, we could be able to tell um, who, the, um, who, the, who the suspects are who are most likely to have been breaking through those windows. So, um, 
So if we know that this, this point here, uh, this point here in the pink, and this point here are from windows, from window glass, maybe a car windscreen and, and other types of windows, window glass, uh, we, we, we could say that the suspect C here, when we plot where suspect C is in this space, um, we is possibly the burglar who's been smashing through the windows, they've got glass, window glass in their shoe. And if these points here in this balloon cluster, so this point here, this point here with different things like jars, headlights, etc., we can then say that these are probably uh, not the suspects. These have got different types of glass um, in their shoes. So from that, uh, so that's a bit of a silly example uh, of how we can use our clustering to, to spot two different groups in, in the data. And um, once we know those groups, we could then recognize those clusters um, as window glass and as um, and as uh, other glass, like uh, bottle glass, jar glass, etc., or headlight glass, or or whatever. And then, um, and, there, and then from there, was able to tell which suspect it was. This is a bit of a silly example, but you can see you could do that process with people, for instance, to recognize different types of people, people who may be um, interested in different services, or maybe about to leave a provider, or etc. So. Um, yeah, or you can even use it in an autonomous car uh, type context, recognizing different types of objects. So this is a tree, this is a, a lamppost, this is a person. And then from that, you could then say, okay, all of that cluster, all that pink cluster is trees, all this blue cluster is lampposts. And, and then you can run your classification steps and train your classification algorithm with, to, with those points, but need to label, go through and label every single one of those um, dots, those blue, pink and blue dots as a window or a or a, or a jar glass, etc., or you know, the equivalent for Thomas cars. So um, I'll just check the questions in just a second. Uh, these are some uh, uh, books I really highly recommend. Um, these are all O'Reilly ones. Uh, they're, uh, they're, quite, they're quite useful for um, uh, for, get, for getting started. So uh, data, um, data science handbook for Python. And uh, that will show you how to use a uh, Jupyter notebooks, that tool that I showed. Um, and maybe, not particularly not, not useful. This um, uh, hands on with uh, psychic learn and uh, carers and tensor flow, so that will get a bit deep learning. And um, also, um, of course, I, the one I mentioned by PT Norvig, artificial intelligence, a modern approach. So um, those are quite good uh, resources to start, and of course, uh, the education you're already in, um, and the online resources, um, even nano degrees, online courses, Udemy, etc., can be places where you can learn. Probably see adverts for it as you watch YouTube. So I'll quickly look at the uh, questions. See if I have any uh, any questions. It looks like not. I've uh, stunned stunned you all, or put you all to sleep. Um, I'm very happy to receive uh, questions on my email. Um, Pmogridge at hearts.ac.uk. If you have any questions about, oh, you'd like to. Um, you have a problem with their uh, Jupyter notebooks or, or, or interest in data science and want, to, uh, uh, want some more um, links you can follow to learn more, I can uh, try to send you that. Cool. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your time, everyone. And uh, thank, you, thank you for coming to this talk. I hope you have a uh, nice rest of your weekend. Thank you.